Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video episode on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I am here today at the James Julia Auction House up in Maine, taking a look at some of the guns that they are going to be selling in their rapidly approaching March of 2016 auction. And two of the guns that I found in the rifle racks up here from the first day of this auction are, I think, pr a pretty cool pair, because these are the two different guns that were designed by a guy named Orville M. Robinson. He was a gunsmith and gunmaker, obviously, uh, lived up in Lake Placid. And his ideas here are actually, they're, they're quite creative, and it's interesting that they might have actually had the potential to become a big thing, except that they didn't. So his first rifle is this one. Um, I should point out, by the way, all of his guns are primarily found with brass receivers, although iron receivers like this one are occasionally, do, do occasionally show up. Um, he did work with both. At any rate, in 1870, he patented the design for this rifle, which has this really cool action that I'll show you in a minute, uh, and started manufacturing them. And he only ended up making these for two years, until 1872, because in 1872, he filed and received another patent, or was granted another patent, for this rifle design, which is substantially different, and in his mind, apparently, was much better. And he manufactured these for another two years, until 1874. In total, manufactured something like 600 guns, maybe a little bit less. And then in 1874, he was actually bought out by the Winchester Company. Uh, they bought his, the rights to his patents, and they appear to have bought all of his existing, at that time, stock of completed guns and gun parts. Winchester was not interested in manufacturing these or improving them. Winchester was interested in getting rid of a potential competitor. So basically, they, they paid him off and shut down his company. Uh, I'm sure he did fairly well in the deal. Uh, he certainly had to have seen some of the potential of his guns, and it appears that he was happy to take the payout from Winchester in a lump sum, rather than take the risk of running his own manufacturing company. So he did actually have two patents, or one patent after this. In 1875, he filed and was granted a patent for a single-shot rifle design, which apparently didn't fall under the terms of his agreement with Winchester, uh, being a single shot rifle instead of a repeating rifle. Ultimately, I think he only made like two, two examples of that gun, or two or only two are known today. Uh, before he left, he moved to St. Paul, and he uh, commenced a new trade in making wagon wheels and violins. So took his mechanical talents and put them into something other than firearms. Uh, we don't really know anything else about Robinson, but his guns are quite interesting. So why don't we take a closer look at both of these? All right, so first off, I should point out that both of these types of rifles are going to have patent markings like this. There's a patent date up there, 1870, and then manufactured by A.S. Babbitt and Company, Plattsburgh, New York. You'll also find these marked as uh, Adirondack Firearms Company. I believe the other one we're looking at here will have that type of marking. Uh, those were the same people. A.S. Babbitt ran Adirondack Firearms. That was a company put together expressly for the purpose of manufacturing and selling these guns. All right, so a bunch of cool stuff going on on this rifle. This is a tube-fed uh, magazine rifle, so it's a repeater. And first off, we have this door that opens in the side. There's a reason for that that I'll explain in a moment. However, for now, it will suffice to let us see what's going on inside the gun. We then have these two tabs on the back of what is the bolt. Now I'm going to pre-cock the hammer, although you don't have to. You can actually do that just by grabbing these. And then you grab these tabs to pull the bolt open. Now you may have noticed there's an elevator here that rises when I pull the bolt back and then drops when I push the bolt forward into battery. So what would happen here is a cartridge from the magazine tube, which is that little round follower right there, would be pushed back onto this elevator and it would go until it hit this block. Now that block is connected to a thumb screw here on the bottom of the receiver and I can loosen it up and then I can actually move this back and forth inside a slot in the elevator. And what that allows me to do is set this for whatever specific length of cartridge that I decide I want to use, whether I want uh, a, a particularly long projectile or a short one. And that ensures that I can set, set this so that the right amount of cartridge comes out so that I can get one round smoothly elevating and feeding without getting, say, the very back of the next round sticking onto the elevator and without the, the end of the bullet of the first round still stuck in the magazine. So I can adjust the l to uh, fit the length of cartridge here. Then, when I pull the bolt back, the end of travel, it cams 
that upwards like that. That lifts our cartridge and this section blocks the magazine, prevents another cartridge from coming out yet. When I push the bolt forward, it's going to, you can see it there, it's going to push that uh, cartridge from the elevator into the chamber and then at the end of travel pushes the elevator down where it's ready for the next cartridge to pop out onto the elevator. Now the next thing that is interesting about this gun is that it actually bears a, lar a significant interesting similarity to the 1886 Monlicker straight pull rifle because of the way that it locks. We can see the locking block right there. It's a block that's built into the bolt and pivots. So the pivot point is right up here at the front. When I push it all the way in, that block pivots down, and when I pull back, it lifts up. That's pretty much exactly how the 1886 Monlicker rifle works. And it is actually quite plausible that Monlicker may have been aware of uh, these guns. They were publicized. Monlicker did visit the United States, and he may well have gotten his inspiration from this. Uh, Robinson never uh, pursued patents in Europe, so it actually would have been an idea available to Monlicker to use. Uh, if I pull the bolt all the way out, you can see that pivoting locking block right here, right there. It can't go anywhere because of the groove in the receiver. But when this is locked in place, when the bolt's all the way forward, this drops down, and then there is a block in the receiver that sits right like equivalent to that that this block locks against. So Robinson had this guy. He was manufacturing these 1870 to 1872. And in 1872, he patents the action for this rifle, which apparently he thought was better, or at least more marketable. Um, you can see it is a little bit smaller and svelter. Um, this is also a tube magazine fed repeating rifle. Um, you'll find them with various lengths of magazine tube, some half, some all the way out to the end of the barrel. And it's got a totally different action. So the 1872 rifle, and by the way, I should mention, if you look online, you will often find these referred to as Type 1 and Type 2 Robinson rifles. Um, it's probably more, more appropriate, more accurate to refer to them by their year designations because they really don't have much in common at all. It's not like they're variances on the same action. So anyway, all right, we still have an opening gate to look into the feedway. I guess Robinson must have liked that. I can certainly understand why. That makes it easy to fix any problems there might be. And instead of having a wing nut sticking out the bottom, we have a slightly more elegant solution for adjusting cartridge length, and that is this sliding plate. What you would do is loosen that screw, and then as you slide this back or forward, it moves this block, which does the same thing as the thumb screw in the 1870 gun. Now, in order to operate this, this one we have to cock the hammer manually first, and then we have a toggle action that lifts up like this. When you lift up this piece, it pulls the bolt back, and as the bolt comes back, the elevator rises. There's our elevator. Then you would push the bolt forward. That's going to chamber the cartridge that's sitting in the elevator, and when you lock it down, the elevator drops, ready to pick up another cartridge. So this is a reasonably strong toggle type lock, but then it's got the additional feature of when the hammer is dropped, the hammer acts as a wedge in here, which makes it impossible to lift the bolt handle. So that, that's an added safety mechanism uh, ensuring that this can't open up under the pressure of firing. So cock that again, and we can see the elevator rise and drop. So here we have the, the markings on the bolt. Uh, now we have an 1872 patent date right up there. And you can see this one says it's manufactured by Adirondack Firearms out of Plattsburgh, New York. As I mentioned before, that's the same guy, uh, Babbitt, who is making these guns for uh, Robinson. You know, quite often it's the case where a, a very low production, old, forgotten, you know, never made it big kind of rifle, usually there's a good reason for that. 
usually there's something not particularly good or not particularly well developed about the action. Honestly, in the case of both of these, I think they, they've got some real potential, or they, they did in the 1870s. You know, I really can't fault Robinson for taking a, a lump sum payout from Winchester uh, instead of taking the risk of, the very real risk of running his own manufacturing business. That's something that might pay off, might, might make you wealthy, but it also has a huge risk of going bust and losing everything, especially back in that time period. So uh, we know this action has real potential because that went on to be the Monlicker 1886, really. Um, whether or not it was directly taken from Robinson's design, mechanically it is the same type of action. So we know that had potential. Toggle locks like this certainly had potential. This is a, a slimmer, manually operated, well, it's an interesting twist on the lever rifle that Winchester was selling. Um, similar in, in type of lockup, but uh, manually operated with the bolt handle instead of a lever. So very interesting guns to take a look at. Well, thank you for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Definitely two guns here that are not very well known, and it's cool to look at them, especially together and see the differences. Um, if you're interested in adding either one of these to your own personal collection, check out the description text below. You'll find links there to the James Julia catalog pages on both of the guns. You can look at their pictures and their descriptions, decide if there's something that you'd like to place a bid on, and uh, either participate online or live here in Maine. Thanks for watching.